Welcome to the Healthful Woman Podcast. Today's Thursday, January 21st, 2021. I hope you enjoyed our podcast earlier this week with Dr. Mackenzie Nayert, and she is back today to talk about first trimester bleeding and subchorionic hematomas. Mackenzie is a first-year resident in OBGYN, but also published one of the largest research studies on this topic. So she's an expert. Bleeding early in pregnancy is really common. Usually, everything ends up being okay, but it is understandably very concerning for pregnant women. Similarly, subchorionic hematomas, which is a fancy term for collections of blood behind the placenta that we see on ultrasound early in pregnancy, are also really common and they tend to be very confusing for women. What do they mean? Should I be worried? What are we gonna do? So Mackenzie and I talk about these related topics as well as the findings from her study, which are super helpful and fortunately quite reassuring. Next week, Dr. Zevi Hamburger returns to the podcast to talk about epidurals. Definitely stay tuned for that one. Thanks for listening, have a great day, and have a great weekend. Welcome to today's episode of Healthful Woman, a podcast designed to explore topics in women's health at all stages of life. I'm your host, Dr. Nathan Fox, an OBGYN and maternal fetal medicine specialist practicing in New York City. At Healthful Woman, I speak with leaders in the field to help you learn more about women's health, pregnancy, and wellness. All right, we're here again with Dr. Mackenzie Nayert, who was with us before to talk about uh, her transition from medical school to residency and what that's like. Mackenzie is an OBGYN resident in Boston at the Brigham, and she's a graduate of Mount Sinai Medical School. We did research together. She's one of my favorite humans, and I'm really excited that you're back to talk about the topic of subchorionic hematomas and vaginal bleeding in the first trimester of pregnancy. Mackenzie, welcome back. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me again. Let's just jump right into it because, you know, from the last podcast, everyone already knows who you are and everyone thinks you're, you know, amazing and super nice. And if you didn't hear that podcast, go listen to it and you'll be convinced. So let's just start. How did you get interested in studying this particular topic? Yeah. So, you know, when I was sort of trying to think about what I wanted to spend my dedicated year of research doing, I knew that I wanted to do something that was going to feel really clinically important. And when I say clinically important, I mean, both in terms of patients and patients having questions and wanting answers and, you know, providing good data for them. And then also from the provider side, you know, I wanted to be answering a question that, you know, physicians, OBGYNs and MFMs, found themselves often encountering. And so when I, you know, started meeting with Dr. Fox, you know, him and I were talking about different research ideas. And I also took the time to speak with a lot of other physicians in his practice, of which there are many awesome people who I miss a lot. And one of Dr. Fox's colleagues, uh, Dr. Knoxby, had done a little bit of research looking at outcomes of subchorionic hematomas in twins. And in doing that research, she really realized that there's not a lot of great data out there about outcomes of singleton pregnancy, so one baby pregnancies with subchorionic hematomas. So I did some initial research myself and spoke to other doctors and, you know, sort of determined that, wow, this is a really important clinical question because a lot of women are diagnosed with subchorionic hematomas during the first trimester and occasionally even the second trimester of pregnancy. And there's just not a lot of data out there. And the data that is out there has a lot of significant limitations in terms of what type of patients were included in the studies and what variables were controlled for. And because of that, you know, it was very difficult to counsel patients with subchorionic hematomas on the outcomes. So from all of that preliminary research, I sort of decided, Dr. Fox and I sort of figured out that this would be a good thing for me to spend my research here studying. That's fantastic. So I I love that you picked this topic. I was also super interested in it. So what, what I wanted to do is I wanted for you and I to take a step back and just talk about sort of the, the clinical situation. So what are we yeah. talking about? What's happening? What are we worried about? What are patients worried about? And sort of what, are, you know, and then go into okay, what did we study and what did we find? So just to take a step back, what exactly is a subchorionic hematoma? Because that's a lot of a lot of big words there. To sort of break it down, a hematoma just generally means a collection of blood. So you can have hematomas in many other parts of the body, 
a lot of people have heard of, you know, like a subdural hematoma or an epidural hematoma. And these are collections of blood around the brain. So a subchorionic hematoma is referring to the chorion, which is one of the layers of the fetal membrane surrounding the pregnancy. So a subchorionic hematoma, sub meaning under, is therefore a collection of blood under the chorion. So it is something that can be visualized on first trimester ultrasound. And I think, you know, most of the time that is how patients first hear about a subchorionic hematoma is, you know, they're getting a routine first trimester ultrasound or, you know, potentially an ultrasound because they were having some vaginal bleeding. And the ultrasonographer or the physician tells them that they see a subchorionic hematoma. Right. So when we tell patients there's a subchorionic hematoma, people sometimes say different things. Like patients come to my office and say, oh, I had a blood clot or I had a collection. Mm -hmm. It's all really the same thing. I mean, the, the placenta, you know, attaches to the uterus and generally it's flush up against the uterus and all the blood flow just goes into the uterus, like through the uterine wall and into the placenta. But occasionally, if let's say the edge of it separates off a tiny bit, there's going to get some blood that doesn't actually get into the placenta, but sort of hangs out there in that space, that new space between the uterus and the placenta. And if we see it on ultrasound, it's, it's pretty easy to see. And we call it a subchorionic hematoma. And most people who have it, they have no symptoms. They feel fine. Yeah. And the pregnancy's fine. The baby's there. There's a heartbeat. And we just, you know, we say, all right, the baby's this size. The heart rate's this. Everything looks good. And you have a hematoma. And we sort of measure it, you know, in centimeters. It's two centimeters by three centimeters by whatever. Okay, so that's that's one scenario that someone just walks in, they have an ultrasound, and we happen to find it incidentally. And how is that different from, let's say, someone who comes in with bleeding? Because it may be due to the same cause with the placenta exactly. separating a little bit. So, and how how is that usually described or thought about? So when someone comes into the office with bleeding during the first trimester, or, you know, often we'll have these patients, you know, call in and, you know, sometimes overnight or during the day, or they'll come into labor and delivery chairs and say, hey, like, I'm a little bit concerned because I'm having some bleeding. And I think, you know, the important thing for, for patients to know is that bleeding in the first trimester happens, you know, it can be in up to one fourth of women of pregnancies. And I think, you know, there's a lot of different causes for that bleeding. And I, of course, completely understand when patients feel concerned and alarmed because they, you know, don't expect to have bleeding once they're pregnant. But I think, you know, the first thing that's important to know is that there are so many different things that can cause the bleeding and that a lot of them, you know, are not serious and will resolve on their own. So it's not, you know, something to initially be overly concerned about. One of the other reasons it freaks people out is the the synonym for first trimester bleeding is threatened abortion, which is like two scary two scary words put together. And so it's <laughs> totally. like people are like I have a threatened abortion. That sounds horrible. And all it means it's like it's the term that we that was given to people who have bleeding, and you don't know what's going to happen. And and I agree, it's very common, you know, a fourth, a third, you know, some some significant percentage of women will have bleeding in the first trimester and the vast majority, nothing happens. They don't miscarry everything. It just goes away and they're fine. And the reason it sort of gets mixed together with this subchorionic hematoma, you know, the reason these, you know, we're doing this podcast together, why they sort of get intertwined is they're both very common, right? It is common for women to have bleeding. It is common to find a hematoma. It's common to have them together, or you can have one without the other. But the thought is that there is an overlapping mechanism, this idea of like the placenta separating a tiny amount, right? The placenta separated a huge amount, like someone would miscarry because you can't have a pregnancy if there's no placenta attached. But if it just a little tiny bit separates, sometimes that collects as blood that doesn't go anywhere, and that's a hematoma. And sometimes it tracks out the cervix, the uterus, and that bleeding, and so the thought is, if someone has one of these, maybe they're at a much higher risk of miscarriage because if the placenta separates a little bit, a tiny bit, maybe it's going to separate more and they'll miscarry. And mm -hmm. again, so so we we frequently see them together and there's a lot of overlap. And it's part of the reason that the research is is complex because if you look at a study on hematomas, well, how many of them had bleeding at the same time or how big were the hematomas or did they have other risk factors for miscarriage or why were they getting an ultrasound? Sometimes higher risk patients get ultrasounds and lower risk patients 
don't. And so you would only find the hematoma on someone who's already at high risk. And there was so much yeah. about that. So when, you know, clinically, when we would see patients who had either of these, you know, we'll go over what we did. But one of the things is it's very hard to sort of tell them what is the likelihood that this is going to be fine versus the likelihood that it's not going to be fine other than sort of our gut, our intuition. Because if you look at the studies, they're all over the place. I mean, there's just, there, there was data everywhere on these hematomas, for example. And so that's, it was a really good reason to do the study to try to tease that all out. And one of the, the reasons we're able to do it is because we have a lot of women who come through our practice and pretty much all of them get an ultrasound early, like 100% of them. So we weren't picking the highest risk women to get ultrasounds. We did it for everybody. So we really had good data on the front end, sort of who had hematomas exactly. and who didn't. That was a big thing. And I mean, listen, you you went through, how many years of data did you go through? Let's see, it was three years, right? Yeah, yep. Yeah, and I mean, we're talking and it was over, I think it was two. 1,000, 3,000, 2,500 like, yeah, like 2,400. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. So it's, it was, it was big numbers. So, so that's, yep. that's great. Now, what do we do clinically? If someone comes in, let's say they have bleeding, like you said, someone calls and they say I have bleeding or they, you know, they they come to the office for bleeding. What is it that you worry about other maybe than they, they could be miscarrying? When I see a patient with first trimester bleeding, there's sort of a couple different buckets that I try to sort of think about the causes. So the first bucket that I think about is sort of non-obstetric causes. So it's important to think about how during pregnancy, the cervix just bleeds a lot more easily. It has, you know, a lot of blood vessels that are developing in the area. And so people can have spotting or even light bleeding after things like sexual intercourse or a pap smear or a pelvic exam, you know, things that might not normally cause this patient bleeding. But because they're pregnant and their cervix is very vascular, they might have some bleeding. So I think when I'm evaluating a patient with first trimester bleeding, I'll often do a speculum exam. And depending on other symptoms, you know, I might do additional things to try and look at the cervix and see, you know, sometimes the cervix has a polyp on it and that can be the cause of the bleeding. Sometimes you can tell that the cervix is just really inflamed and the patient might have cervicitis or they might have you know, vaginal discharge and itching and other symptoms that would make me think that this patient has vaginitis and that that might be, you know, the cause of their bleeding. And so I like to sort of think about those causes and sort of try and eliminate those things as causes of the bleeding before I think about obstetric causes and things that are more directly related to the pregnancy. So that's your first bucket. What's bucket number that's two? That's my first bucket. <laughs> so then bucket number two is obstetric causes. Mm -hmm. And I think you know, this is when what people are really worrying about when they have vaginal bleeding during early pregnancy because people are worried about pregnancy loss. But you can have vaginal bleeding in a viable intrauterine pregnancy that, you know, that isn't associated with pregnancy loss. You know, for example, one of the things that we think about is implantation bleeding. Right. And, you know, one to two weeks after fertilization, when the fertilized egg is implanting into the lining of the uterus, it's totally normal and healthy and physiologic to have some bleeding at that time. So that's, you know, one of the things that I'm thinking about. And when you said you specifically used the term intrauterine pregnancy, why did you use that specific word? You know, when a woman takes a takes a new urine pregnancy test at home and, you know, has, you know, the, the plus or the, the correct line on the stick indicating a pregnancy, what we're testing for is a hormone called beta HCG. And that hormone can be because the woman has a pregnancy inside the uterus. So we call it an intrauterine pregnancy, but it can also be from an ectopic pregnancy, which is a pregnancy that occurs outside of the uterus, most commonly in the fallopian tubes. And so if a woman is coming into the office or coming into triage and has this positive pregnancy test at home, and they haven't had an ultrasound yet. We, you know, we don't know yet at that point if this is going to be a viable intrauterine pregnancy or if this is going to be an ectopic pregnancy outside of the uterus. Right. And I think that that's such an important point. And, and it really, it seems so vast and so complex of what all the options are, but it actually ends up being relatively straightforward. You know, if someone calls me with bleeding. I agree that the first thought is, well, is this from the pregnancy? Is it not from the pregnancy? And the way we know that usually is by the exam, sometimes based on the story, they tell me like, why are they having bleeding? What happened before? But usually the exam, 
And then they need an ultrasound, right? Because if there is a, if, yeah. if we know if the pregnancy is in the uterus, we know it's not an ectopic pregnancy. So that's off. And then if I see a pregnancy in the uterus and everything looks fine, then generally the outcomes are very good. So if someone calls me, says, you know, I'm pregnant and I'm having bleeding, you know, the first thing I want to make sure is does she have an ultrasound and we'll do that, make sure it's in the uterus and see how the pregnancy looks and we'll do an exam. And after that, generally you'll know pretty much what's going on and be able to give either very reassuring uh, news, say, hey, there's a pregnancy in the uterus, everything's the right size, the heartbeat is good. And because of that, your risk of miscarriage is very low. It tends to be under 10%, under 5% based on exactly how far pregnant she is. Yeah. Or unfortunately, it's, it is a miscarriage or it is an ectopic pregnancy, you know, something that's, you know, what we were hoping it wasn't or none of the above. It's a fine pregnancy, but she has bleeding for some other reason, like you said, either the cervix. And so the, it's not a very complex evaluation. The only time it gets complex is when we can't figure out if the pregnancy is viable or not. And this is when they have to come back and repeat a blood test or repeat an ultrasound. And we're just not sure what's going on, but usually it's pretty straightforward and the only other thing we have to you know, think about is we look at her blood type, and this is sort of like a, a unique thing to pregnancy where if it's if her blood type's anything negative, like A negative, B negative, we have to give her something called Rogam. That's its own podcast, but that's something we need, we need to know. And that's really it. It's it's pretty straightforward, except the details of the ultrasounds. You know, what if, how far pregnancy, what if there's a hematoma, what if there's not a hematoma, and how much bleeding she's having, meaning heavy versus light. And that's sort of how how we do it clinically. Is that how they do it in Boston? Am I missing yeah, anything? Yeah. They're, they're, you know, Sounds they're real great. smart in Boston, you Harvard people, <laughs> you know. Oh, gosh. <laughs> any new, you guys don't have any new fancy ways of evaluating people? Unfortunately not, no. And again, it, it's really, fortunately, most people are not going to miscarry if the ultrasound looks normal. And by most, I mean the vast majority. Once you see uh, an embryo with a heartbeat inside the uterus, you know, unless there's something that looks really off on ultrasound, the likelihood of miscarriage is, is some low number, right? There's there's sort of some details that'll affect that number, which is one of McKenzie's other research projects. I was just gonna say, our <laughs> study, yeah, our yeah. study that just got accepted to be published, um, Dr. Fox and I looked at a lot of different factors that in, impact a woman's risk of miscarriage and created a little table where you can plug in, you know, a patient's age and number of prior miscarriages and get an estimated risk of pregnancy loss. Right. But like you said, it's very low. <laughs> yeah. It's lower than people think it is. Like when yep. women, when women have bleeding, they usually think game over, like that's it, you know, and they're terrified and they call and even on the phone, we say, listen, it's most likely fine. Come on in. We'll take a look. And if they've already had an ultrasound where we know it's an intrauterine pregnancy with a heartbeat, you know, you could sort of be more reassuring then. But even if they have, we say, come in, we'll take a look. And if the ultrasound's normal, you know, and everything's, you know, seems to be sort of uh, in line with what it should be by size and by heartbeat, then really the likelihood is pretty low that she's going to miscarry. And, you know, obviously some women go on to miscarry. I Meaning women who miscarry will start with bleeding, but the most women who bleed do not go on to miscarry. And the other thing, which is in terms of what do we do about it, the problem is usually the reason women miscarry is because there's something abnormal with, with the pregnancy, with the genetics of it. So there really isn't much we can do that's going to prevent miscarriage if she's having bleeding. Usually it's sort of like it's going to be what it's going to be. And that's some people find that very horrifying that they have no control over it. Some people find it very comforting that they have no you know, they can't screw it up. Like it's, you know, it's going to happen. It's not going to happen, but that's yeah. just the reality of it. We really, we're just observing. We have little control. I mean, people have tried progesterone, which with very limited success, if, or some would say no success, bed rest doesn't work. There's really nothing that, that helps or hurts in that circumstance. You just have to wait and see how it plays out. Yeah, exactly. So let's go into your study. You said you looked at the women who had the, the, the early ultrasounds is about 2,500 women. And how did you set that study up? What was what, what were you trying to compare? So we did a couple of different studies with subcarinic hematomas. But our first study was really looking at the association between the hematomas and pregnancy loss in singles and pregnancies. And so we looked at all of the patients over a three-year period. So it was a little bit over 2,400 
women and gathered a bunch of data on their pregnancies. So we got a bunch of, you know, information about the patients, including their demographics, as well as other important information about the pregnancy and about the outcomes of the pregnancy. And then in women with subchorionic hematomas, we also got information about the hematoma because we, you know, in addition to wanting to know, are these hematomas associated with a risk of pregnancy loss? We were also wondering, you know, if so, are there certain characteristics of the hematomas, such as size, volume, the associated presence of vaginal bleeding, or the association of additional hematomas that were going to be associated with pregnancy loss? So in our sample, there were about 450 women, so close to 20%, with subcoronic hematomas. And so we basically compared the outcomes of the pregnancies with hematomas to the pregnancies without hematomas. And what did we find? So we found some good news for patients (laughs) with subcoronic hematomas. We found that after controlling for all of the variables, that there was no significantly increased risk of pregnancy loss in women with hematomas. And even beyond that, we found that, you know, looking at the hematomas, all of the different ways that I described before, including by volume, by largest diameters, by presence of bleeding, by presence of additional hematoma, there were no characteristics associated with pregnancy loss. In simple terms, we took you know, almost 500 hematomas and looked at them every way that we could think of. And none of these ways had an increased risk of pregnancy loss, which is super reassuring. We only included women where the embryo had a heartbeat, which is important because that sort of changes the numbers because if there's no heartbeat, it may already be a miscarriage before that happens. But, you know, for basically for women who come and in the first trimester have an ultrasound and you find a hematoma, what we found was the likelihood of a miscarriage was seven and a half percent. And if they didn't have a hematoma, it was 4.9%. So that seems like it's a little bit higher, but Mm -hmm. number one, both those numbers are small. So that's good, right? It's under 10% for everybody. But what ends up happening, interestingly, is it seemed to be most related to how far pregnant they were, meaning hematomas are more likely to be seen earlier in pregnancy because that's when they are and they tend to go away with time. But if you're early in pregnancy, you're also more likely to miscarry than if you're later, meaning because the longer you go in pregnancy without miscarrying, the lower your chance of miscarriage. And because you sort of made it that far, it's like a sort of like the uh, like the TV or TV show Survivor, like you've made it to the next week. You made, and so it's, <laughs> exactly. right, it's, it's literally yeah. like that. So meaning, for example, the, the women we saw who were six weeks, the chance of miscarriage was 12 percent. But by the time they got to, you know, let's say 11 weeks, it's only 2 percent which makes sense. And so it, yeah. it seems to be that the reason the hematomas had a slightly higher slightly higher risk of miscarriage was because they were t- only seen earlier. It wasn't really because of the hematoma. And that was interesting because again, older studies, it was they weren't as big. They didn't have as many numbers, like as many women with hematomas to try to sort this out. And some of the studies made it seem like if you had a hematoma, your risk of miscarriage was much higher. And we did not find that. And it's very reassuring. You know, I see women in ultrasound now and I see, you know, everything looks fine and I see the hematoma. I tell them, don't worry about it. Like your chance of miscarriage is low and it's not higher than if you didn't have the hematoma, which is really great. And that's an important thing. And then what was the the follow-up study did? Because there's also some thought that maybe it affects outcomes later in pregnancy, not related to a miscarriage, things like preeclampsia or how the baby's going to grow or preterm birth. Second study, we sort of took the research one step further and we were looking at outcomes later in pregnancy. So we looked at the gestational age of delivery, you know, thinking about risk of preterm birth. We also looked at birth weight and specifically birth weight less than the 10th percentile for gestational age, also known as intrauterine growth restriction. And then we also looked at conditions that are associated with the placenta, such as placenta abruption, as well as gestational hypertension and preeclampsia. And once again, we found what is really, you know, reassuring news for patients because we found that there was no increased risk of these adverse outcomes later on in pregnancy from having a first trimester subchorionic hematoma. This was great to find this out. I mean, I remember when we when we first looked at the results, how excited I was that it came out this yeah. way. You don't know how it's you don't really know how it's going to play out. You may have, you know, your your sort of gut of what it's going to be just from, you know, taking care of these women and sort of seeing it, you know, happen. But to really, you know, collect all the data and look at it and analyze it, 
it was really exciting. And there's a reason that these got published. I mean, both of these studies got published in obstetrics and gynecology, which is what we in the business call the green journal because the journal itself <laughs> is green. Uh, but that's like that's like the American journal for OBGYN. That is the one that's in the US, the biggest one. And here you are, you're a medical student and you're the first author on these two big studies on this topic. Do you do you have people like saying, oh my God, wait, you wrote this study. I just looked this up. Does that happen to you in residency? Like are people starstruck by you? <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't say starstruck, but I have found it really cool when I've been, you know, in a patient encounter and heard, you know, a, a, another doctor counsel a patient about subchronic hematomas and share these results. And, you know, I don't know if anyone's ever like made the connection with, oh, that's that girl sitting over there in the room or <laughs> in the hallway, but. That's an intern know, it, crying it, in the hallway. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah, but it, in my mind, I'm smiling. I'm like, oh, that, you know, that, that's kind of cool. And I think, you know, there's definitely a bias in research against publishing what are considered negative studies. So studies that, you know, find there's no connection between two things or, you know, in our case, no association between subchorionic hematomas and adverse outcomes. And there's been a big movement, you know, against this because it's as important to publish negative studies as it is ones with positive findings. So I think, you know, it's really awesome that we were able to get this research published in the Green Journal, which has such a wide readership despite the findings. I think that is really important. With research, there are two elements to it that to accomplish it, to achieve it. The first is sort of that cerebral part to think about, you know, what is the question? How are we going to design the study? How are we going to set up the statistics? How are we going to write it, interpret, you know, that part that you sort of do that. But there's a ton of roll up your sleeves, elbow grease type of work that goes into this. And, you know, what you had to do was crazy. I mean, you basically had to go through 3000 charts. This wasn't just yeah. some database that existed and you just sort of like pressed a button on the Excel spreadsheet and you got all your answers. You had to build it from scratch, which is crazy. And that's one of the reasons these things don't get done is because in yeah. order to get a good database with the right variables, you know, sort of formatted in a way that you want with the correct information that's not just pulled out of a computer. I mean, you actually have to look and make sure it's, you know, verify that it's correct. It's a ton of work. I mean, that's why it took, you know, close to a year. I mean, you were like twice as fast as anyone thought, so you did in six months. But, you know, <laughs> it, it's a ton of work. But that's the reason these studies are not as common. They're hard to do. And I think that when people read this, they're like, wow, you went through 3,000 charts. You got all this data on every single patient. And then you can get really good, uh, reliable statistics. And it's amazing. I Listen, I am so proud of you. And I'm so proud that we work together on these uh, and I use this all the time when I'm counseling patients because I see this literally every day of the week, either someone who's bleeding or someone has a hematoma. Yeah, wow. And and we and we I show them these studies and I'll say, you know, I'll tell them who you are and I tell them to call you and I give them your cell phone number. <laughs> and I say she's <laughs> in Boston. I've been getting now. all those yeah. spam calls. <laughs> yeah, you're you're she's in Boston now. Does it feel does it feel strange that you're an intern, but you've publish these, you know, I mean, I'll call them landmark just because why not? I can. It's my podcast studies. Does <laughs> How does that make you feel? I just feel really lucky to have been able to work on a project and, you know, have it be published in the Green Journal, but more importantly, you know, have it have been clinically significant in a way that, you know, can impact patients on a day to day basis. I think during pregnancy, you know, there's so many things to be worried about. And if I yeah. can help, patients have one less thing to be worried about, then I feel pretty good about that. <laughs> That's great. I mean, yeah, listen, I, I totally agree. And and just to review, you know, to for for the for our listeners, first trimester bleeding, common. Subchorionic hematomas, common. Common for them to happen together or alone. Most of the time, everything is going to be fine either way. Really, it's just an evaluation to make sure the ultrasound looks good. If the pregnancy looks fine, the heartbeat is good, the likelihood of a miscarriage is very, very low. It's not zero, but it's never zero. Even if everything looks perfect and everything is going perfect, it's not zero. But fortunately, it's very low. If someone does unfortunately ultimately go on to miscarry, it's not because they didn't do anything or because they did something it's generally just a problem with the pregnancy from the beginning. But again, moving into that process, most people will not miscarry uh, when they have these symptoms or these ultrasound findings. And that was sort of our experience. And 
the research that you did and took the time from medical school and, you know, had to show up in my office every day and deal with all the terrible <laughs> jokes and, you know, all the nuts <laughs> stuff that goes on our office really is valuable because people are going to quote this study for a very long time because I don't know if anyone's going to have the, you know, the wherewithal to go through 3000 charts again because they'll feel like, well, I should have. Someone, <laughs> someone already did that. I don't have to do that again. And I think that yeah, that's, there we go. no, and I think that that's, uh, that's amazing. And I, I really um, look forward to the projects you're going to continue to do as you move forward in your career and, and what other types of clinical questions you could help answer for the rest of us so we can, you know, take better care of our patients. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Mackenzie, well, I'm going to follow your career closely. Please do. Stay in touch. <laughs> I will. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for taking the time. I know that probably is the only free hour you have in the entire week. So thanks for spending <laughs> oh. it with me. And hopefully, oh, yeah, me. hopefully when you cure COVID, we can see each other in person. Oh, that would be amazing. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Healthful Woman podcast. To learn more about our podcast, please visit our website at www healthfulwoman.com. That's H-E-A-L-T-H-F-U-L-W-O-M-A-N.com. If you have any questions about this podcast or any other topic you would like us to address, please feel free to email us at hw at healthfulwoman.com. Have a great day. The information discussed in Healthful Woman is intended for educational uses only. It does not replace medical care from your physician. Healthful Woman is meant to expand your knowledge of women's health and does not replace ongoing care from your regular physician or gynecologist. We encourage you to speak with your doctor about specific diagnoses and treatment options for an effective treatment plan.